afternoon, everyone. Thanks for, for joining us um, this afternoon for our, a special forum. Um, wanted to also say thanks to our regular participants um, because I, of course, like everything we've adapted uh, during this time and uh, people have uh, really taken to the webinar format. We usually, of course, meet on Monday mornings. Um, along the way that has changed like everything else. Uh, so we appreciate you joining us over the lunch hour. We are uh, very happy today to have as our guest secretary, Caleb Frostman from the Department of Workforce Development here in the state of Wisconsin. So um, we're gonna get right into it, but first I'm just gonna lay out a little bit of, of what to expect today and then introduce the secretary. Um, so the secretary is gonna start, give us a little background on what um, DWD has been working on over the last uh, year, year plus, two years now going on. A um, Couple of topics related to, to unemployment insurance, different um, recovery and relief efforts that's uh, channeling through his agency, as well as um, some of the, the regular workforce programs uh, that they've stayed engaged in over this time. Uh, a reminder, if you are um, want to ask a question, uh, use the Q&A uh, function at the bottom of your screen. Uh, you can submit it through chat too, but if we can try to keep it in the Q&A function, uh, that'll help us uh, monitor the questions as well. Um, so we'll have the Secretary's presentation and then uh, questions and answers uh, following that. I'll step back in and, and moderate the Q&A. So uh, without any further delay, uh, Secretary Frostman, um, prior to his appointment at the Department of Workforce Development, he served as a state senator uh, from Wisconsin's first district. Um, for those of you who don't have the Senate, state Senate maps memorized, uh, it's essentially the thumb of the state of Wisconsin and some of the surrounding counties. Uh, he previously served as Door County's Economic Development Corporation Executive Director uh, and has worked in uh, commercial real estate finance uh, prior to that. Grew up in Green Bay, um, graduated from UW-Madison Business School, uh, served on the boards of numerous local workforce development and tourism organizations, as well as the advisory council of Big Brothers and Big Sisters of Doran County. Uh, avid outdoorsman, enjoys hunting, fishing. This is the first time I've seen this one, Secretary, beekeeping. I've never seen that on anybody's bio before. So you're a first, and gardening as well. So thanks for supporting our pollinators, and with that, uh, Secretary, I'll turn it over to you. Great. Well, thanks, Nathan, and thanks, everyone, for uh, having me today. I always appreciate the opportunity uh, to speak with Wisconsin's business leaders and to hear what's going on in our communities. And uh, as Nathan mentioned, we'll uh, just kind of start with an overview. Uh, I think uh, a lot of folks have been interested to hear uh, what's going on in the unemployment insurance world, and you'll have to bear with me a bit. Uh, we just incorporated slides. We've been doing most of these uh, verbal over the last few months, but some of these visuals are pretty striking, and I think it just helps provide some context as to uh, the volume of what we've seen and what we've um, you know, had to work through uh, these last six months, which it's hard to believe, uh, you know, that big COVID day is kind of March 15th and we're coming up on six months, but I will uh, share my screen here quickly and just go through a quick number of slides before hopping into a few other things, but uh, let's choose this. Okay, can uh, folks see that okay? Good, okay. I will uh, try to do the slideshow, there we go. Um, so this story uh, came out uh, as part of ABC News. This is a national graph. Uh, prior to COVID-19, the previous record for the most number of new claims in a week in the U.S. was 695,000 back in the 1982 recession. Uh, in the second week of COVID, we beat that record tenfold and then remained above a million new claims a week for 20 straight weeks. Uh, we broke that streak recently, but then had more than a million the week after the streak was broken. So this just lays out what that previous record is, what uh, the Great Recession looks like. And so you can see this is really like nothing we've ever seen before as far as volume and rapidity with which uh, COVID-19 economic uh, impacts hit the state of Wisconsin. Here are some Wisconsin specific graphs just to show you again, um, you know, our previous record based on our data, we don't have uh, data back to uh, 1982 uh, for that recession, but uh, our previous record was in the dot-com crash, more than doubled that. And then when we look at weekly, uh, this is also, I'm sorry, this is also initial claims. Um, uh, COVID versus 82, COVID versus Great Recession, pretty uh, illustrative as far as the, the volume and, and the speed with which this hit us. Uh, this is just a quick glance at 
what the first 33 weeks of the Great Recession looked like as far as new claims in that orange line. And then this is the first 33 weeks of 2020 with the blue line. So uh, really a mountain of volume as far as claims uh, in the state. The next one's weekly claims. So initials when you first file, weekly is when you uh, are filing to get paid. Uh, and these are your recurring ongoing claims. So we have seen a pretty uh, steady drop off since March and April, uh, which we're grateful for obviously. Uh, but those early uh, huge weeks and months of volume uh, obviously contributed to a pretty uh, big workload. And then just a quick look here at uh, you know our cumulative new claims for um, 2020. So this is 853,000 just from the last, uh, about in this graph, about the last five months, March 15th through August 15th, was uh, almost three times as much as we had in all of 2019. And these are for new claims. For the recurring weekly claims, we were more uh, than three times as much uh, in a five week period. So really uh, just, of course, the, use, the word's been used way too much, but unprecedented historic uh, claim volume. And these next couple of graphs, I think are pretty uh, helpful too, to kind of show where our workload is at at DWD. Um, I think actually the next graph is more helpful. So the blue body of claims are those that have been paid. Um, orange is what is currently held in adjudication. And you can see based on this graph that we are working from oldest claims to newest. So those earliest weeks and months are much, much narrower within that ribbon. And then uh, red is denied. So the, the totality of this graph is, is what we've uh, received. If you add the um, blue and the red, that's what we've resolved, meaning paid or denied. But that orange ribbon uh, shows where our uh, ongoing caseload for cases at adjudication might be. And in Wisconsin, uh, we are very, um, it's unfortunate we've got some of the most complicated UI laws in the country as far as what is required to be adjudicated. Uh, for example, in an 18 month period prior to separation, we have to investigate every job separation from that 18 month period, which requires sometimes phone calls to employers, uh, whereas some other states are able to just investigate the most recent separation. Um, but that's a, an illustration there of, of kind of where our workload lies uh, as far as a, a time frame. And then this was really illustrative to our, our chief economist at DWD, um, responded to a request to, to show, uh, you know, what industries are most affected by the COVID-19 economic uh, repercussions. And the, um, I'm trying to move this quick if folks can see it. Um, the table on the left shows the unique claimants by industries of folks that filed an initial claim, meaning your, your first claim, and then what that represents as far as a percentage of that overall industry based on our 2019 numbers. Now, this isn't what's still going on. It wasn't you know, all at the same time where 42% of manufacturers were unemployed, but this lays out you know, what approximate percentage of the workforce in those industries had at least applied for um, initial uh, unemployment insurance. So perhaps not surprising because Wisconsin is so heavily concentrated in manufacturing, that was a big, um, big chunk of claims. And then um, obviously from what we've heard over the last six months, our tourism, leisure, uh, restaurant services, um, not surprisingly, are also really high up on that list. And then this next one was also a breakdown uh, that uh, folks were looking for between um, large employers and small employers, uh, which I think the uh, cutoff was a payroll of $500,000 or more or less. Uh, but again, uh, on those large employers, you're looking at uh, manufacturing and maybe, maybe it's surprising, maybe it's not, but for uh, all the volume of work that healthcare workers have to do, uh, that was relatively high for large employers. And then on the smaller side, uh, again, those, those mom and pop restaurants, uh, hotels, folks that were uh, catering to in-state, out-of-state tourism, your normal, uh, you know, where folks would congregate um, and um, ignite commerce, those were heavily affected uh, throughout this COVID pandemic. And then this is also just, um, again, to provide some, some context and thank goodness we've, we've since tapered off, but um, you can see this is what our, our calls uh, call volume looked like into our benefit center at uh, DWD. Uh, we peaked just shy of 6 million phone calls the week of April 18th. Uh, I think now we're, we're under 100,000 across all of our platforms, uh, including two separate call centers and uh, DWD staff. So uh, very um, happy to have you know, caught up on that piece and get uh, folks the answers they need on the, on the phones. And so we'll just jump back quick. I'll exit this if I can. Uh, for being a, an elder millennial, I'm sometimes technically challenged, but this is going fairly well. So um, I think it's helpful for us, I think, to also 
you know, to address that, that huge volume of, of claims that came in uh, on the first part of the year, uh, we had to respond with uh, hiring people and we hired a lot of them between hires in, into DWD, uh, transfers from within state government or reassignments, uh, and then also uh, bringing on uh, some, some vendor staff. We brought on uh, a couple call center vendors, some adjudication vendors. Uh, so all told, we started uh, the pandemic in unemployment insurance around 500 people, and we peaked at about 1,950 people uh, in July, which includes those vendors and our uh, reassignments and uh, also new hires. It's been uh, you know, a near, near quadrupling of that staff, and of course, hiring those folks, uh, vetting them on the front end, and then training them so they're able to do some of that meaningful work. Uh, it takes time. And so we have seen uh, an uptick in our productivity as those folks have come on board. Uh, as they've been trained, as they've become more seasoned, uh, but we continue to see really um, a pretty sustained uh, workload within DWD and within uh, UI. And so um, that's uh, in a nutshell where we've been at with, with UI and hopefully um, it helps provide some context as to where we've been and kind of where we're going. But uh, even though it's it's been, uh, sometimes it feels like an ever slow slight pivot, pivot uh, we have been pivoting more toward uh, recovery and, and DWD, uh, for those that don't know, has six divisions, one of which is unemployment insurance, uh, one of which is also employment and training. And so when you think about apprenticeship in the state or you think about uh, programs like Wisconsin Fast Forward, uh, we administer those and, and we're the first state in the country to do apprenticeship, uh, also the first state in the country to do unemployment insurance and workers comp. Uh, but we are uh, looking toward um, you know, what our programs can do, how they need to be tweaked, how we can be most useful to the most Wisconsinites to, um, you know, help lead an inclusive, equitable recovery, and you know some of the the best things we can do uh, to ensure that, uh, you know, are around containing and eliminating COVID, the hand washing, the distancing, the the mask wearing, all of those things uh, are really important to containing COVID, which is the kind of linchpin to getting us back to a, a more normal economic place. If, if folks have been watching. Uh, we have seen our state's unemployment rate tick down month over month. Uh, in March, we were at 3.3. In April, we are at 13.3. And we've since, um, I think our, our July numbers were at 7%. So we're moving in the right direction, but we are still down 216,000 private sector jobs year over year. So there is still a, a whole lot of work to do in um, getting folks back to, um, getting back to work in Wisconsin. And so I would encourage um, anyone in this call to, Take a look. Our partners at the Wisconsin Economic Development Corporation have done a great job in delivering some uh, reopening guidelines, uh, looking at the, the health measures, the safety pieces. Uh, it's wedc.org slash reopen dash guidelines. Uh, they did a really good job, even including some industry specific guidance. Uh, but I know WEDC put a lot of work into that. And it's also, you know, been, um, I think lightning's the right word, but we had seen some of the, the cracks and the fissures in our economy prior to COVID-19 as it relates to um, economic justice and racial inequalities and broadband connectivity, lack of availability of childcare, all those things were present and um, certainly visible prior to COVID, but they've been exacerbated and certainly exaggerated by the effects of COVID-19. So you know, I mentioned those words, we wanna have an equitable and inclusive recovery. And we think that you know, a lot of our, our current programming and what we're hoping to deliver can, can certainly ensure uh, that this is an equitable and inclusive recovery. And one of the, the good uh, segues into you know, some of those programs, I think one of the best success stories as it relates to um, the pandemic and, and state government, at least on the economic development side or workforce development side, maybe, uh, is our WorkShare program. And so for those that aren't familiar, WorkShare is a program that allows employers to uh, partially reduce hours for their staff and they receive pro rata wages, uh, but they also get partial unemployment insurance and perhaps, uh, maybe not most importantly, but just as importantly, uh, they stay attached to their employer-sponsored benefits, so their health care, uh, things that, that folks, you know, when they lose a job, uh, they're often uh, dislocated from. So uh, prior to COVID, Wisconsin had uh, one work share plan in place with about uh, 20 employees, and I think over the course of four years, we might have had 20 uh, plans with 1,000 employees over four years. Uh, we peaked in March, or sorry, in July, uh, or June or July in uh, WorkShare, I think in July, with almost 700 WorkShare plans and almost 23,000 people uh, participating in WorkShare. So that's, you know, 23,000 employees uh, that weren't laid off permanently. That was, you know, almost 700 employers that were able to keep some productivity, 
uh, keep their staff on the payroll, uh, keep them contributing to their bottom line and to their communities. And so we're really bullish on WorkShare and are working really hard uh, to evangelize the benefits of the WorkShare program. There were some changes made to it uh, in early April uh, as it relates to some of the legislation that was passed uh, around COVID-19. Uh, folks are able to use a smaller number, so you can do as few as two employees on a WorkShare program. I believe it used to be the greater of 10% or 20 employees. Uh, now it's as few as two, and then you can reduce anywhere between 10 to 60% of uh, employees' hours. Uh, that used to be 10 to 50. And then also through the end of the year, uh, all benefits paid, uh, UI benefits paid on uh, WorkShare are uh, paid through federal dollars. So really tried to make that more attractive. So I'm not sure if it's uh, correlation or causation, but regardless, we're grateful that so many employers have taken WorkShare seriously and have helped uh, avoid uh, more uh, permanent layoffs uh, throughout the state of Wisconsin. And we continue uh, to connect people. And this is something else too, that since uh, COVID has hit, there's obviously been a lot of folks dislocated temporarily or permanently from, from their work. And so one of the tools that we are really proud of and, and how it's been utilized throughout the pandemic has been uh, Job Center of Wisconsin. Uh, that's a, a free labor exchange for both employers and employees. And we've seen really strong usage of this uh, over the course of the last uh, couple of months. I think we peaked in June with about 250,000 resumes on uh, what we call JCW. Uh, it's at this point 120,000 resumes and about 72,000 jobs posted. But it's really, again, it's free. It's meant to be uh, employer and job seeker friendly in that uh, you can search uh, by geography, you can search by skill set, uh, even military status or veteran status. So we've seen pretty strong utilization of uh, Job Center of Wisconsin, but any employers on this call uh, looking for uh, employees, uh, there are a lot of uh, job seekers out there, qualified folks looking for work, uh, and we encourage folks to uh, take a look at that uh, website. And I know there's you know, a fair amount of um, discussion around job services around the state. And even though uh, the vast majority of our physical job centers are closed, we continue to provide services virtually. And I think we've been uh, pretty pleased with how that has gone thus far. We've obviously learned some lessons, including uh, lessons around broadband connectivity and computer literacy uh, in the state. But we are continuing to have our teams work with uh, local workforce development boards uh, to connect employers to job seekers. Um, and that also includes uh, over these last few weeks and months, there have been a handful of drive-through job fairs that have been uh, put on uh, with different partners around the state. And again, those have been better than expected. I think they've, uh, at least the one in the Fox Valley was a smashing success. I know folks are planning more of those uh, going forward, but we continue to kind of discover what each area needs and uh, are happy to connect uh, those businesses to those job seekers, either through uh, remote services at our job centers or uh, through those uh, job fairs that have been uh, conducted by a drive-through. And we, we hope not to use uh, these folks more than we have to, but our rapid response teams have been uh, fairly busy this summer with uh, Verso up in Wisconsin Rapids and uh, down in Milwaukee with uh, Potawatomi. But um, those are the folks that show up when there are massive layoffs and we're hopeful, uh, as I've said, to keep those folks on the sidelines that there aren't many more uh, mass layoffs to come, but um, those folks stand ready to help. And then the last couple of things I'll touch on are just some of our flagship programs that uh, we're leaning into in this uh, crisis, um, one of which is uh, Wisconsin Fast Forward. Um, that's a, an employer-driven uh, training program uh, from which we try to uh, deliver transferable skills, recognize credentials to workers, uh, and it's kind of a dual purpose meant to help folks uh, become employed, but then also uh, advance their uh, economic standing within employment uh, with advanced training. Uh, we just gave out uh, $2.5 million worth of awards in June. We're hopeful to do another uh, round in uh, maybe October or November. Uh, so please keep your eyes open for that. And then as we always do, um, we are very, very bullish on our apprenticeship programming. We were the, the first state in the country, but also uh, remain uh, a leader in both youth apprenticeship and registered apprenticeship programming, both of which uh, have looked a little different in 2020 with uh, COVID-19 requiring you know, some virtual instruction and also uh, in many cases, some virtual work. Uh, but we are very, very pleased to be uh, delivering some new uh, curriculum, some new uh, apprenticeship opportunities uh, throughout uh, the state of Wisconsin. And we were just awarded a $9 million federal grant uh, to expand apprenticeship into new sectors, uh, into new occupations. And so we're working hard to uh, make the most of those uh, $9 million going forward. 
And something else, you know, I mentioned early on the equitable and inclusive recovery. Um, we also want to make our, our uh, apprenticeship programs more inclusive. We um, have work to do when it comes to geography, when it comes to industries, uh, and when it comes to having representation from uh, women and apprentices of color. We just have not had um, great traction there, but we're working very hard uh, to make that a reality going forward. And then on the uh, youth apprenticeship side, uh, it's going to be an interesting school year for a lot of students and a lot of youth apprentices, uh, but we saw really strong demand again this year, a slight dip year over year. Uh, we're expecting uh, about 400 school districts to participate in 37 consortia with about 6,000 students working in uh, youth apprenticeship this year. So we're very excited about that and obviously ready to, to learn as we navigate uncharted waters uh, going into the, the school year and seeing how uh, our youth apprentice employers and youth apprentices themselves uh, navigate this. And we are obviously working very hard to make sure that those partnerships are successful uh, with our local consortia uh, and with our folks at DWD. And then the last thing I'll touch on just before we wrap up is uh, we were really excited to uh, deliver uh, an interesting uh, innovation in a, a post-COVID world. Um, think about your break room or your water cooler where all those labor law posters are posted for all to see. Um, we were able to deliver a, an online repository of all of those um, posters, uh, kind of an e-work board uh, for employees to know their rights, for employers to know their rights and obligations, and so that can be found at dwd.wisconsin.gov slash eworkboard. Uh, but when we look to continue you know, protecting Wisconsin workers and, and helping employers understand uh, our, our labor laws, we thought that was an important resource, uh, especially as so much work has transitioned uh, remotely here in 2019. So uh, in about a 20 minute nutshell, uh, that's what we've been up to as it relates to UI, uh, kind of how we're pivoting toward recovery and some of the programs that we're seeing uh, being utilized very successfully and what we plan on uh, leaning into here in the coming months and uh, into 2021. So uh, with that, I'm happy to answer any questions. Okay, great. Thank you, Secretary, for that presentation. Um, we did have, we have one question come through, but I wanted to start um, with one of the one of the questions I had first. Um, and so if you have questions, please type them into the Q&A. It also occurred to me that I did not introduce myself at the beginning. So as a part-time moderator, uh, my name is Nathan Franklin. I'm the External Affairs Director at Gunnison Health System. And so welcome everybody who has joined us. Uh, thank you for doing that. Um, I was thinking about your background, the Secretary, and um, the unique circumstance of this recession um, being a pandemic and it's kind of on, uh, on, it's hit service industries especially hard and being from one of the meccas of, of tourism in the state, you've got a unique background in workforce development and tourism um, and seeing how the pandemic has hit the service sector. You're almost like tailor-made for being in the spot you're in right now related to that. So just some insights. I don't know if you've had a chance to reflect on that, um, how that's helped um, you lead Department of Workforce Development during this unique time? Uh, that's a great question. And we certainly have seen, um, as you saw in those graphs, a really high influx of, of claim volume from those industries. And you know, I think some of the things we've learned, um, and we were pushing for this last year, hoping for you know, an increase in the weekly maximum benefit rate. But when you're looking at, at different points of this pandemic, you know, 13%, 10%, now we're at 7% of Wisconsin's workforce trying to make it on you know, a maximum of 370 a week. That's really challenging for a lot of people, no matter where you live. If you're in rural Wisconsin and urban Wisconsin um, without uh, the FPUC, which is at $600 a week, and for folks that you know, aren't attached to a UI qualified employer, uh, if you're a freelancer, or independent contractor, um, you know, we were grateful to see a program like Pandemic Unemployment Assistance uh, be implemented for some of those folks that otherwise would have been left behind. So we've had, I think, about 103,000 folks apply for PUA, which would not have been eligible for UI and would have been um, you know, really challenged to make it. And so looking at the shortfalls of our state system and how they uh, affect some of the, the claimants out there uh, or you know, our, our neighbors that were affected by COVID-19, uh, it's been pretty eye-opening. And some of the stuff you know, we knew already that it was hard to make it on 370 a week, which is why you know, Governor Evers and, and our administration put forth a proposal for increasing that uh, last year. But just that's been um, you know, pretty enlightening and, and I'm sure um, you know, challenging for a lot of folks. But um, you know, those are some of the things we've, we've, we've picked up on. And 
um, you know, it's never, never occurred. We had a 10% month over month jump, but you know, obviously when you have that much volume and that many uh, people and that many anecdotes and that many experiences, you really are able to um, kind of un uncover a lot of the challenges that um, you know, might've been there when, when unemployment was at 2.7%, but they're just such a smaller volume of folks experiencing uh, the system that um, it wasn't quite as uh, obvious or prevalent. We've got some questions coming in. Thank you for that from our crowd. I'll, it was a good segue to our first question. Um, the question is if relating to how the pandemic has hit some industries more so than others, has do you, does the agency have any flexibility? Has there been any consideration about how you can um, make special accommodations for industries that have been hit harder, for instance, you know, uh, the service sector, restaurants, manufacturing versus, you know, somebody who's maybe relatively insulated from, from this recession. Sure, I mean, I think our, our uh, approach to this is, is looking at our eligibility determinations. There have been some instances, uh, whether it's through WorkShare, obviously that's employer coordinated, uh, but we try to work with employers wherever we can to help them better understand the unemployment insurance process. So that can be streamlined for their employees. Uh, because a lot of times, you know, that some of the issues that require adjudication, not all the time, certainly, uh, but some of them can happen in the uh, application process. And so if we can avoid any of those things and get the information we can from the employer uh, and have those put in um, you know, really accurately in the front end, that can help uh, expedite some of those processes. Uh, but industry specific, it's challenging because our, our um, eligibility determinations really aren't um, necessarily tailored toward different occupations. Um, there are some that you know have different challenges, like educators, for example. You know, we if you're not if you're on a scheduled break, you're not eligible for UI. But if you were laid off, then you are. And then there are also school district employees that aren't teachers. And so some of those nuances, you know, make things a little bit challenging. But uh, I think we've we've tried to navigate those and innovate as best we can uh, in the volume we've had to work with. But um, that's been a, a bit of a challenge. Okay, thank you. Um, Similar uh, vein, but a little bit more global in policy. Um, any discussion about Wisconsin um, working to receive the additional $300 per week for eligible unemployment recipients? And if so, how long would those funds actually last? Sure, so we officially applied to FEMA late last week for the Lost Wages Assistance Program. Um, when that first came out, there was uh, many, many more questions than answers. and so. Uh, running all of our traps and making sure um, we knew all we had to know in order to apply. We got that in last week. We've not officially heard from FEMA as to whether we're approved yet, um, but we're hopeful that will come soon. Uh, and then they are allocating uh, three weeks of payments to each approved state initially. Now that's about a $44 billion fund, or I should say it's $69 billion fund, and the program will stop when either the $44 billion allocated is expended or um, if there are other expenditures out of that fund and it drops to 25 billion, uh, that program will end. So I think at this point, uh, I think a lot of people are, are really just banking on that initial three week allocation. Certainly, um, you know, once that is, is programmed at our end and we're paying out those additional uh, supplemental dollars, we're hopeful that that could last longer. We were very supportive of extending the FPUC program as it was uh, administered for three months this summer, uh, the $600 per week. Uh, add-on for anyone eligible for unemployment insurance. Uh, that would have been a, a much faster, um, you know, programming fix for us. And it also would have been, you know, more supportive and longer lasting for uh, the folks that needed it. But um, we'll see if Congress can come back in. The LWA had an application deadline of uh, September 10th. Uh, and we're hopeful, I guess, that, that Congress can come together soon to come to a more long-term solution. Okay, related to that, um, got the additional $300 per week. You mentioned a $9 million federal grant earlier. Um, little mention of the um, potential next stimulus and some discussion about that potentially happening this month. Are you anticipating any additional you know, state or federal workforce funds being available to help businesses, help workers? Yeah, so we're hopeful we applied for a $15 million uh, economic training recovery grant through the Department of Labor. Uh, we've not heard back on that yet, but you know we've been pretty strategic in, in seeking uh, a lot of grants, but of course ones that we can you know really get a high return on investment on and use them relatively quickly. 
uh, and deploy those dollars around the state. So we're hopeful on that one. We did just receive a $5 million opioid grant through the Department of Labor uh, late last week to help uh, both with recovery efforts and with workforce development for uh, folks affected by opioid addiction in Wisconsin. So that was a, a big win for us to help um, you know, some of the most vulnerable Wisconsinites. And so um, we're always on the lookout. We're hopeful on that $15 million, but uh, between the $9 million in apprenticeship and uh, the $5 million in opioids, we're feeling pretty good about uh, deploying those dollars wisely and earning a, a pretty strong return on investment. Good, thank you. So coming back to your agency, um, Jennifer Schilling has the question of, um, as employees, employers have learned, have leaned into the important infrastructure of technology and remote workforce, how has the technology need at DWD been highlighted with the current and future need of unemployment insurance and other systems that you use there? Great question. So we currently operate on about a 50 year old IT mainframe system uh, known as uh, COBOL. And that's been really challenging for us, um, mainly in that um, A, it's old, B, it's antiquated, C, it's pretty inflexible, but it really, um, I guess the biggest challenge has been that it does not allow us to do simultaneous programming. So when we onboard these new federal programs, uh, we have to do them in sequence, one at a time, which you know is not ideal when you're trying to uh, pay folks under PUA, give them the $600 a week benefit through FPUC, uh, help those folks that have exhausted benefits through PEUC, and you know onboard this new lost wages assistance program uh, as we you know work with this um, you know relic of a system and have to do these programmings in sequence it's really really challenging so these flaws were they were known coming out of the great recession and the system wasn't modernized um, and so we're really hopeful that you know there's really strong urgency momentum and buy-in around modernizing coming out of this uh, depending on how you finance it and what you do with it if you know if dwd were to uh, you know, make investments and, and own the system and, and do the modernization. It could be you know, between 50 or $80 million in a you know, three to seven year project. But um, you know, based on what we've seen with how this system is um, you know, really challenging from a programming standpoint, but also from a timeliness and from um, you know, pulling data, uh, we would really, really, really benefit from a modernized system. And I think there's the urgency and the momentum to make that happen, hopefully coming out of COVID-19. Thank you. Um, there's been some, you know, anecdotal discussion about concerns about folks returning to the workforce with elevated unemployment insurance benefits. Have, have you seen any of that? What's your experience been um, with that as far as actually what does the data show? Sure. I mean, it, it's, I'm a little skeptical, especially knowing, you know, UI law within Wisconsin, if you, you know, refuse work, then that is considered a work refusal and you're ineligible for unemployment insurance going forward. Um, so if folks are turning down work, then that likely would have made them ineligible for the ongoing $600 a month or $600 per week. But I think it's important, we looked at that um, in the big picture that that $600 per week was meant to be you know, stimulus in nature, it was meant to be temporary. And you know, when you look at providing 100%, an average of 100% wage replacement across the country, you're gonna have some folks that you know, make more than that and make less than that. And so um, you know, the other piece to remember too is that $600 a week um, is taxable as is uh, state UI. And so you're paying taxes out of that. Uh, you're not getting your employer sponsored benefits, you're paying your own health care. you're contributing to your own retirement. And so um, you know, I've heard some of those anecdotes. I, I guess it makes me a little skeptical just knowing um, you know, what has to come out of that extra money in order to, to make it in Wisconsin. Uh, and then also understanding some UI laws around if you're refusing work, um, then that $600 goes away. So, um, you know, it's certainly an Im Im imperfect science trying to uh, figure out that right number, but, you know, we were supportive of extending uh, FPUC at the $600 week level, not just to keep those families afloat, but to help those businesses that sell takeout food, that sell go going back to school clothes, that, you know, um, thrive mm -hmm. from uh, consumer spending. And, and if Wisconsin's uh, you know, maximum going forward is going to be 970 for a couple, or sorry, 670 for a couple of weeks with the LWA and uh, maybe 370 without a supplement. Um, that's a real challenge, not just for those families, but for uh, our communities and our economy. Okay. Um, Secretary, you mentioned apprenticeships, which are real popular in, in this area and a lot, quite a few uh, companies in this area. I, I think of um, First Supply, for instance, very interested and very active in the apprenticeship field. Um, and you mentioned that 
some difficulty attracting people from diverse populations into apprenticeship. What what are the challenges there? Is it is it the viewpoint that apprenticeships are are so locked into being seen as a manufacturing trades sort of route to employment, or or is it just it, or are there real cultural divides where we're not communicating the opportunities across industries and apprenticeships? Sure. Just, you know, observing over the last couple of years, I think it's a, really a mix. So part of it um, depends on geography and, and school districts. So from a youth apprenticeship perspective, there are some smaller areas in the state that just knock it out of the park and have a way higher than normal proportion of, of students that use YA. Um, I know like Milwaukee Public Schools, for example, are, are not um, a, a really high user of Y. It's getting better. Um, and then part of it also is on the diversity side are what we traditionally think of as which industries use apprenticeships. So, you know, construction, um, manufacturing, some that have been more heavily male uh, industries going back. Where That's why we're trying to expand the industries and the occupations that use the apprenticeship earn and learn model to, um, you know, provide that unique opportunity where someone can be in the workforce and in most cases earning a living wage while uh, learning an in-demand uh, skill that leads to a credential that follows you anywhere. Um, and then part of it also just, it, it depends on, on the location um, you know, for youth apprenticeship. Part of it is that that cultural piece, and I think you just say societal culture in that, um, yeah, the, the you know, whether it's the parents or the administrators or the teachers, it's really hard um, sometimes to shake that idea that the only path to personal economic prosperity is a four-year degree. And that's a great path, you know, but it's not necessarily for everyone. And so I think we are making inroads on that. I think there's you know opportunity both in youth apprenticeship and in registered apprenticeship, but I'm on the tech college board and I get to see the outcomes of apprenticeship every year. Um, and it's just, it's an average across industries, so take it with a grain of salt, but the average uh, salary for a journey worker that completes their apprenticeship in Wisconsin uh, is around $80,000. And that includes you know, operating engineers that are north of 100,000 and um, other folks that are less than that. But as an average, that's a pretty compelling number, um, especially for, you know, you, you're getting paid while you're learning that skill um, and so we'll always, I think, be bullish on apprenticeship and, and hopefully expand it into new industries, geographies, and populations. Thank you. So last chance for questions. I'm not seeing any. Um, so I'll give people one last chance to, to uh, enter them in there. Um, any best practices you've learned, you know, with all the challenges that the agencies faced? Um, any best practices? that you've taken away you know to improve the operations of the agencies um as well as any you know lessons learned any pitfalls that you came across that you would handle differently now yeah well going back to uh you know jennifer Schilling's question about technology is how important that is to have that as up-to-date as possible because you just never know what you're going to need yeah. the most you know modernized system to deal with you know new uh, issues and so that's been uh, a really important lesson learned and then even if i wasn't in dwd Having technology to work remotely, you know, we've seen how that has gone. I think that's been really interesting from enterprise wide. I wouldn't speak for any other agencies, but for DWD, I think once we kind of got over the initial shock of working from home, I think we've been pretty pleased with productivity and with um, connections. Obviously, it requires a little bit more work to stay connected to your to your staff, but I think this is likely going to be, you know, an ongoing uh, reality for a lot of folks. Not even just because of COVID nineteen, but because um, you know, it's viable for a lot of employees and a lot of employers. And then, you know, more, I guess, from a managerial perspective, I think just, you know, making sure that our employees feel supported. I think they, from our experience, we've had six months to, to do it all. And I feel like we get the, the best work out of our folks when they really feel uh, supported. You can still hold folks accountable, have high standards, but, uh, you know, make sure your team knows that they are supported. Um, and, uh, you know, I think also having clear expectations and, um, you know, making sure you're not over-promising, under-delivering, you don't want to be doing the, the opposite of that. But um, no, I think it's been a really challenging six months. I mean, my, I'm, I'm so inspired on a daily basis from my team's uh, empathy, compassion, you know, the, the phone calls they take um, are just heartbreaking. And uh, to continue doing this day in and day out uh, for six months is, is really, uh, really, really challenging. And it wears on folks and they're, they're hanging in there and, and still doing good work, so. Good to hear. And related, we haven't picked up any last questions. So maybe in closing, um, we have had a lot of bad news in 2020 and obviously in workforce development, dealing with unemployment insurance, I'm, I'm sure you, you 
get your share of, of bad news and as you said, you know, heartbreaking stories. Any any good news you can share, any stories or outcomes that have happened that really stand out to you and you know the things that you maybe hang your hat on on those tough afternoons um, looking back when you need something positive to think about. Yeah, I mean, I think we we gravitate or um, you know are really pleased to celebrate the success of WorkShare, and that's you know a more proactive step that we I tried to do some outreach around that, and that has been helpful to stave off some of those permanent layoffs. Um, otherwise, it's just everyone we get you know some nasty grams here and there, but we get a lot of really uh, grateful messages from folks that are obviously in the most trying economic time of their life and um, anxious and scared and. Um, frustrated and, and when they you know, have a good interaction with with one of our staff members and, and write to tell us about it um, you know I save some of those and read through those uh, to remember that you know the people that work at DWD they don't do it for the prestige they don't do it for the money they don't do it for you know the the public um, adulation they do it because they want to help people and so um, that's just a great baseline for me to remember when uh, the days are tough and they're long and um, you know, things are stressful that uh, we've got a couple thousand people doing really really challenging work uh, and they're bringing their best selves to work every day to, to help uh, their neighbors who, who need it, so. Great, thank you. Well, with that, uh, Secretary Frostman, thank you very much for spending the better part of an hour with us uh, this afternoon. The La Crosse Area Chamber of Commerce definitely appreciates it. Um, and thanks everyone who joined us and stuck with us. We appreciate you, you tuning in over your lunch hour. Um, with that, we'll close the webinar. And again, uh, special thanks to Secretary Frostman for joining us. Thanks, everyone.